Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on basic cybersecurity everyone needs, a step-by-step -step guide. I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County. I'll be your host. Our presenter today is Dr. Teresa Polaris. More on Teresa in just a minute. First, some brief info on SCORE. There's over 320 offices and 11,000 volunteers nationwide. We're part of the Small Business Administration. SCORE Fairfield County has over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value-added services to small business owners. Free one-on-one -on -one counseling, two educational workshops and webinars over 150 per year, and three extensive resources on our website, including Word and Excel templates to help you build your business plan. SCORE puts on many webinars each month. Look for future events on our webinar calendar at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Some useful information about today's event. If you have a question, please use the chat window at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end at one o'clock to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available on our website within the next couple of days. Now our speaker. Dr. Teresa Polaris is CEO of TCR Inc., a cybersecurity and IT consulting company. Previously, she held senior management and technical positions at Accenture, Beringer Ingelheim, PepsiCo, and Pitney Bowes, and was a professor of computer science and management of technology at NYU Tandon School of Engineering and a visiting professor of computer science at Iona College. She has a BS from University of Illinois, an MBA from Iona, and a PhD from NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Welcome, Teresa. I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. So today we're going to talk about cybersecurity that everyone needs. And I will try to walk you through a step-by-step -step guide on how to get started. We're going to talk about six different types of controls and within those controls, 17 different practices that comprise basic cybersecurity. People ask me, why would you do these particular controls? Well, these are controls that have been around for many years. The National Institute of Standards created these practices and recommendations. They've been around for decades. If you are a government contractor, the federal acquisition regulations requires that you have all these controls in place and that you self attest to that. If you're going to be handling federal contract information that's of a, uh, of a, of a confidential nature. If uh, you're interested in becoming a defense contractor, uh, these practices also represent the, various, the very lowest level of cybersecurity that's permitted to even look at what the solicitations are and what the contracts are. So it's a great starting place. And regardless of whether or not you're a defense contractor, these are industry best practices for cybersecurity, highly recommended. So we're going to start by talking about solar winds. Solar winds is a network management product that can be used to monitor all devices on a network. It's actually the software is used by every branch of the military, over 80% of the Fortune 500, and it was breached last year. It actually was probably breached sometime in 2019. There are reports that there were preliminary runs on in, back in 2019 to test out the solar winds attack. Why was this attack so important and why are we talking about it today? Well, it was used by all top 10 telecommunications providers it's used by all branches of the military and they're all breached. 
uh, the State Department, the National Security Office, the Office of the President, uh, they were breached in this attack. What, uh, and SolarWinds was actually not the person, not the company that discovered the leak. It was found by FireEye. It was a company that was using their software and they discovered some troubling behavior. One of the network engineers noticed that there was a request to add a new phone number for multi-factor authentication on the network. And the network administrator followed up and called the employee and said, is it really true that you want to have another phone added? And the employee said, no, I had nothing to do with that. And that led to an investigation where they realized that there was a pervasive hack and uh, most likely propagated by the Russian government. Uh, the United States government has formally charged Russia of being behind this particular attack. The company had been warned about their cybersecurity pra practices publicly uh, going back for years. There was a security researcher named Vinu Kumar, who back in 2019 said, you know, your update soft uh, server has a very weak password. It's SolarWinds123. Anybody can use this password to break into your server, you need to fix this. And it wasn't fixed for a considerably long period of time. No one knows exactly all the details of how the breach occurred, but uh, once it, uh, it launched, it's sort of like the Australian rodent problem. It's very hard to get rid of. Colonial Pipeline was in the news back in May. It was the largest US refined oil pipeline and it was shut down for five days in a ransomware attack. DarkSide used, an, and that is a ransomware as a service type of hacking group, found an old company account and they used that to launch their ransomware attack. The CEO was called to testify before the Senate Homeland Security Committee, and he admitted that he had paid a $4 million ransom so that the company files could be unencrypted and would allow them to continue their operations. When you pay a ransom and you're given access to your files again, it doesn't mean that the malware that started that attack is gone. In fact, it's likely still there lying in wait. Another attack that was in the news not too long ago, back in June, is JBS. They're the world's largest meat processing company, and they paid an $11 million ransom in Bitcoin. This was a ransomware attack promoted by our evil and it shut down Australian and US processing uh, uh, plants. Our evil is like dark side. They offer ransomware as a service. So they develop malware that can be used to compromise various targets and they license that to partners and they take a cut of the ransom that is collected. When experts have looked at this, details are always kind of murky. Nobody uh, wants to go totally public on all the uh, gory details. But the fact that the company network worldwide was impacted shows that the company could have done a much better job segmenting their networks so that they could control the spread of the malware. What we're going to talk about today are ways that if you had uh, have uh, certain basic precautions, it would help uh, mitigate these uh, initial attacks. What we definitely uh, want to do is make sure that you're not low hanging fruit for a hacker. You want to have a reasonably good defense. And if it's hard enough for a hacker to get into you, that they'll move on to some other target. And this is the starting point. 
We're going to talk about these various control families, a total of 17 practices. And as we go through this discussion, you'll see that there's tremendous overlap between the different controls. They work hand in hand together. Access control requires identification and authentication. Physical protection, it can also be a form of access control. So these particular types of controls are not mutually exclusive. They work in tandem. And the reason we're presenting them in the order and fashion that we are, is this is the way the National Institute of Standards has developed the standards. And if you're going to prove compliance with these particular standards, you need to address them in the order and in the way that we are presenting today. So when you think about a company, business information, there's actually quite a lot that needs to be safeguarded. You have financial information, customer information, personnel information, intellectual property data, government data. And we had talked about uh, earlier how the government requires these cybersecurity practices to be in place to handle federal contracts. And so this is uh, federal contract information. The abbreviation is FCI. So what we're talking about today will address all of the requirements that the government has for handling FCI. It's a legal and business and ethical obligation to safeguard this type of information. But one thing that I want you to take away from this seminar is that these basic cybersecurity protections are not enough to, uh, to properly safeguard all these other forms of restricted data. There's another type of government data called CUI or controlled unclassified information. And that is information that could have impacts on national security if it were publicly known. And CUI has another set of standards called NIST SB 800-171. And these standards are much more comprehensive than the FCI standards. So we're talking about the 17 standards in place to protect federal contract information. And it provides a basic level of cybersecurity for all companies. However, for a moderate level of security, you need to follow an additional 93 controls or a total of 110 controls that are documented in this NIST technical document called NIST SB 800-171. So you'll see that it, it can get pretty complicated. We'll try not to make it too complicated today. So we're gonna use a case study. We're gonna look at a small manufacturer with a DOD contract uh, called Rivets. It'll, the company has five employees. It has seven locked doors. You'll see all the different doors here. Uh, and one unlocked door, which is the water closet. The company is a window shop. They use multifunction printers, iPhones. They have a cable modem, a Wi-Fi router, and one Wi-Fi extender. So our question is, what sort of basic cybersecurity does Rivets have to have in place to meet these 17 practices? So here's just another picture of a Rivets Inc. from a network diagram perspective. What you see here is the company headquarters. They have a manufacturing area, a server room, a lobby, an executive office, and an all-purpose storage room. And they have connections to the internet. Sometimes the company owners do work from hotels when they're traveling. And uh, we look at all the places where the company has sensitive information, it, it's located next to all of these arrows. So uh, we have stuff in the cloud on smartphones. We have physical media delivered in the mail. We have 
confidential documents and file cabinets on the printers, on the PCs. So it's, it's all over the company. So we need to protect this. So the first of the six controls that we're gonna talk about today are access control. The first access control says, you have to make sure that only authorized people are using authorized systems and devices. You need to make sure that the authorized people and devices are only doing the things that they're permitted to, to do. You need to look at the connections from within your facility and outside your facility and make sure that they're legit and that they are only the connections that uh, need to be in place. And finally, you need to control information posted or processed on publicly accessible information systems. When you go back to the first case study that we talked about with SolarWinds, they had an update server that was publicly accessible on the internet with an easily hacked password that made it very easy for a hacker to get in. So if that control had been um, you know, be better, uh, better managed, uh, it might have helped limit the scope of the attack. So when you think about how am I going to implement the access control, you're going to use a combination of strategies. It's not like one single thing that you can do. You want to have a multi-layered attack. You, you want to use what we call uh, the app security measures, administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. You want a combination of those to make a secure uh, access control implementation. One of the key aspects of cybersecurity is making sure that all your employees have awareness of how important it is and that they're aware of policies and procedures and their roles and responsibilities. When you're developing identity-based access control, you are basically saying you have to prove your identity in order to be given access. And ways that you can do that, you can insist that people wear an identification badge, that when they log in, that they use multi-factor authentication, and that you use strong passwords. Another type of access control that a company needs to consider are what types of access rights should you give different types of roles within the company? What I often see in small companies is say the owner will have administrative rights to everything and they'll use that admin privileges for everything that they do, even though they don't strictly need to have those admin privileges. You really want to make sure that if you're uh, using the admin role, it's because you're performing admin functions. But if you're performing other roles as say a plain user, that you're using a username and password and an account that are more appropriate to the limited role and responsibilities. You need to have a control matrix. This can be a spreadsheet. This basically lists for all the company employees what sorts of access rights are they allowed to have for the different types of software? I oftentimes uh, find that companies struggle with this, and yet there's no way you can control the access if you don't know who has access to, to what, and there's no way to implement this in a technical solution if you don't have it written down. So this is a first step. Policies and procedures can go a long ways to improving your access control. One thing you want to make sure is that when employees are brought on board or have job changes or they leave the company, that the appropriate processes and procedures are in place. A lot of times companies struggle with terminating the email, passwords and system rights after someone has left the company. Well, that leaves a big security hole. 
Another thing you need to do is identify where information is uh, generated and where is it going. And based on that, you can implement strategic controls on your network. You need to make sure that if you're working remotely or your employees are working remotely, that they're using only authorized devices and systems and that they comply with the company policies and procedures, even though they're offsite. Another control and policy and procedure that is needed is that you need to authorize individuals who will be allowed to post information publicly and that there are regular reviews of the content before and after information is posted on a public information system. Like you think about a Facebook company page or LinkedIn page. If um, well, sometimes people will post things that really they shouldn't. And so you want to have a process in place that will prevent that. You look at access controls, physical. So a lot of these are probably familiar to most people. Most companies tend to get this right more often than these other controls, alarm systems, keys, lock cabinets, uh, surveillance. The key thing is you want to have the same level of security for your equipment and assets off premise. I'll see cases where people will go traveling and they'll put their computer in the back of a uh, trunk of a, a rental car and that uh, rental car gets stolen or uh, the trunk gets popped open and the laptop gets, gets stolen. And if they don't have all the controls and uh, passwords set up on their equipment, well, then there's a big company breach. You need to have technical controls to manage your various user accounts and to access the restrictions on who's allowed to do what. And you need to have controls on remote access. The account management means that you have a process for registering approved users and deregistering them when they are no longer authorized. You need to have a way of provisioning the access that people are given, and you need to distinguish between ordinary users and privileged access rights management. As I said before, you can be a company owner and you need to have both types uh, and only use the privileged access rights when you absolutely must to do a particular function. So for access enforcement, you do that through passwords and multi-factor authentication. In the case of rivets, they're going to use Active Directory. They'll use network controls like routers to control the flow of data within the network, firewalls to examine the traffic and to make sure that uh, it, uh, it, it looks like it's normal traffic. You want to define a network architecture that will minimize the impacts of a malware intrusion. So we talked earlier about the JBS hack where someone got in and the entire worldwide network was compromised. If there had been different network segmentation, uh, possibly it could have prevented that, uh, the scale of that malware attack. There are external control systems that a company can use uh, and that could mean uh, that you use uh, FedRAMP compliant AWS systems, you can use uh, Microsoft Office enterprise systems to help manage these controls for you. And there's also something called SEAM, which is a security information and event management system. And what it does is it collects information throughout your network and it is specifically looking for events that look like there's a cyber incident and that there's a mechanism provided in the software tool to alert the appropriate people so actions can be taken. Because it's very hard to monitor all this stuff in real time 24 by seven if you don't have automated tools working for you. So we talked a little bit about remote access before 
Again, you need to make sure that people are using company authorized devices that have the security controls. You need to uh, have multi-factor authentication and strong passwords, antivirus, um, all these same protections that we talked about at the workplace have to be in place at home. One of the things that oftentimes gets overlooked is uh, USB protections. USBs are often used by company executives to take information home and work on their computer at home and just keep going around the clock with their, with their work. But this really puts people at risk. Uh, a lot of uh, cyber attacks have been perpetrated using malware that's been preloaded onto USBs and um, pop that in your computer and within seconds it is uh, infected. This is an actual live advertisement on the web, a USB rubber ducky. And you can see it literally was sold out when I took this screenshot. This is a device you can buy for not too much money. You can plug it into a target machine and uh, you can install malware, steal credentials. And um, you don't even have to have the USB drive in the computer uh, once you've loaded all the malware. So these things are pervasive and uh, for people who have uh, evil intent, it's pretty easy to get your hands on this stuff. So we looked at uh, Rivets Inc. And so after making all these changes that we talked about, we are using a VPN, we're gonna use Microsoft uh, Office, in this case, a G5 account because they're a government uh, contractor. We're going to lock the file cabinets and we're going to develop a whole bunch of policies and procedures and training. So we still have more to do. We need to do identification and authentication. This is identifying is making sure that we know who you are and authenticating is proving that you are who you say you are. So you can use uh, user identifiers. We talked about before the need to have both privileged and non-privileged account names for every user um, that has a need for uh, different levels of access. Another thing that is very critical is you cannot share sign-in credentials with anyone. A lot of times I'll see uh, companies will wanna save money. If you're buying a, a Microsoft account, they charge you based on the number of users. And so they'll share accounts, employees will share accounts. That is a complete no-no. Once you share the account credentials, you've lost complete control and uh, that's something you never want to do. Other technical controls that you need are uh, ways to authenticate the person and to uh, register them, to deregister them, to manage their secret user authentication information, uh, have a password management system. So Windows Hello is uh, one uh, built-in service that uh, Microsoft Windows provides, but you need to have a mechanism for doing this. You need ways to identify the devices that are on your network. There are device identifiers that are built in to the devices themselves called uh, MAC addresses. Uh, every device on the network has an IP uh, address. Uh, there are ways that you can thwart all these uh, different controls, but uh, you can use uh, these device identifiers to help make sure that you're only having authorized devices on your network. Firewalls and routers can control your network connections and help uh, monitor the traffic. And you need to have those in place. A lot of companies I see will have a wireless uh, uh, connection from say a cable company for internet, but they don't have the firewalls. And that's, that's one of the big things you need to do to upgrade your system security. Media protection is talking about um, the need to sanitize or destroy information before you dispose of it. 
Now, there are lots of forms of hard copy media that companies store. It could be negatives, drawings, papers. You definitely don't want to just pitch this stuff without disposing of it properly so that uh, dumpster divers can get into it. So we're going to look at our case study. We've got rivets. They've got all these uh, hard copy uh, information that they want to get rid of. It's in their file cabinets. What's the proper way? The first thing to do is to remove all the labels, markings, and activity logs before you destroy the medium. The next thing that you can do is shred your documents. You should use a crosscut shredder producing particles one millimeter by five millimeter or smaller. Or you can outsource this to Iron Mountain or shred it. You'll notice that these particle sizes that I've listed here are a lot smaller than the shredders uh, that you buy at Staples produce. You need to buy an expensive, uh, high quality shredder to make sure that when you do shred uh, your media, it, it can't be reconstituted. Another way that you can get rid of confidential documents is to burn it. But you have to make sure that when you do that, the residue is uh, reduced to white ash and you have to make sure that the burning is allowed in your area. Another way of managing your hard copy disposal, um, what's important is you need to make sure that things are empty before you remove them from protected areas. A lot of times I'll, I'll see that there are folders that are stuck in between drawers. And uh, this is one of the ways that sometimes confidential information gets leaked. So uh, when we look at uh, the hard copy storage, the recommendation for rivets is you take your um, file cabinets and you consolidate them. And uh, you make sure that you have authorized staff overseeing your disposal process at all times. For electronic media, and there's lots of it, we talked about that before, you use somewhat different procedures. So here Rivets has CDs and DVDs, all kinds of information that they want uh, to get rid of. And they wanna know what's the best way to do that. Well, in the case of CDs, uh, you know, they've used this to back up their data. What, what should they do? You need to destroy in the order that's listed here. First, you need to use a commercial optical disc grinding device if you're disposing of a CD to remove the outer information level layers. Then you need to incinerate. If it's a DVD, you don't have to do that. Then you need to incinerate using a licensed facility. And then you take the waste from that and you put it through an optical disc media shredder or disintegrator device. Now this is a lot more than what most people do. Most people think, oh, I just put this through my staple shredder and I've done my part. Well, no, in this day and age, it's not sufficient uh, to protect the information from being recovered. The smartphone, the owner wants to buy a new phone and give her old one to a new employee phone will only be used on site for business purposes. She must sanitize her phone. And now how can she do that? Well, this is pretty easy on an iPhone. You can just go into general and then reset and erase all contact, all content and settings. So that's pretty straightforward. If you have a USB drive uh, and you want to repurpose it, uh, how should you go about uh, disposing of the information? Well, one way would be to just destroy the USB drive, but that's not generally what people want to do. But if you are going to destroy it, you have to shred, disintegrate, pulverize, or incinerate, and incinerate using a licensed facility. What's probably more likely to happen is uh, you'll want to override it. BitLocker to go is a built-in function in the Windows operating system and you can just insert your USB drive into a Windows machine, use BitLocker to go to encrypt it, you reformat the drive, you re-encrypt it, and then format it again, and then you 
truly have a USB device that's been cleaned. You'll use a similar process if you want to donate or clear up your old uh, hard drives. I know some people have said, oh, I got rid of my computer and I just smashed it with a hammer. Well, that's not really a very good way. I've seen um, people who uh, were experts in the field and they would take a hard drive that had been damaged in this fashion and they would just tape it back together with scotch tape and using forensic tools, they could read the information on the disk drive. So you need to use uh, better controls, sorry. Uh, to do that. So we're gonna use a variation of what we talked about before with the USB drive. You use BitLocker drive encryption and uh, encrypt your hard drive, format it, re-encrypt it and format it. And at that point, you can be assured that the information on it is unrecoverable. Physical protections are the fourth access control. Basically, you need to limit access uh, to the systems. And I'll just go ahead. The key actions are you have to design your security office, your offices with security in mind. You have to require visitors to present government issued credentials so that you know that they really are who they say they are. You need to monitor visitor activities. You need to keep the audit logs secure. You need to keep an audit log of everybody coming in and out. That's part of the, the standard for making sure that you have uh, good controls. I see a lot of companies that will put a paper audit log on a clipboard hanging in the lobby and anyone could take it, change it, lie about their names and they're not very secure. So that doesn't cut it if you have to uh, follow these standards. You need to guard your keys and change them. A lot of times small companies will uh, keep the same locks on forever and employees come and go. Uh, they just trust them that they're not going to make copies or misuse uh, those keys. And, and that's not a good strategy. Probably a better strategy is to use electronic keys where you can change the, the passwords as required. The fifth set of uh, communication safeguards are saying that you need to monitor what's going on uh, communication wise inside the company and as information is being sent outside the company. And you want to implement subnetworks that are physically and logically separated uh, from the internal networks. We talked about this with the JBS hack that was worldwide. They'd had better subnet networking. Uh, it might have helped uh, slow down or stop the spread of the malware. The way that you do this is you have to have a lot of policies in place. We're not going to go into all this, but you'll see that you have to have a lot of uh, things written up formally that talk about what kind of data are you handling, what are the guidelines for handling it, what uh, happens when you're sharing information with third parties, how are you making sure that they're going to follow through and handle the data in accordance with all the requirements. Uh, with the physical controls for system communication, uh, if you're getting sensitive mail deliveries, you need to make sure that you have a secure way of collecting incoming and outgoing mail and internal documents and files and various types of media. We talked about the seam before. This is another way that you can ensure system and communication protection. The final control is system and information integrity protection. Uh, the first thing is you need to have a process in place to identify flaws and to correct them in a timely manner. And this means you've got to have a process in place to identify the problems and manage and fix them. And you need a whole slew of policies and procedures to help assess how are you doing? Where are you vulnerable? A lot of companies don't do this because they're not staffed to do that. This can be very hard for a company. Uh, for system and information integrity protection physical controls, disable those USB ports. They're uh, not allowed for the government contracts that 
uh, contractors that we work with, you want to keep your network equipment locked so it can't be tampered with. And you need to keep unauthorized people away from your electronics and files. You need to have antivirus and malware protection installed. You need to be careful when you're selecting your antivirus and malware protection that you're going with a reputable company. A lot of Kaspersky, I would say, is maybe a reputable company, but it's banned by the United States government because it is Russian. And when you think about what does an antivirus program do, it looks at every part of your computer. And so uh, you want to make sure that it's not compromised because you wouldn't, wouldn't know it. That's how a lot of these uh, large scale attacks have occurred. You have a trusted uh, third party software that you use on your machine that gets infiltrated and then it spreads malware to your computer systems. That's actually what happened recently with uh, Kaseya, which was in the news over the 4th of July weekend. This is a remote monitoring uh, service that a lot of managed service providers use. And it's a trusted software program. So uh, it was, uh, Kaseya was compromised. Uh, and uh, again, it was this R evil group. And uh, it impacted hundreds, uh, well, actually many thousands of companies. It was uh, not such a pervasive attack in the United States, but there were uh, thousands and thousands of companies throughout the whole world that were impacted with these ransomware attacks from Kaseya. So you need to be careful in your third party selections. So when we look at what did uh, rivets do to fix everything that they, uh, that they needed to do, we saw in the beginning that they put in VPNs, they lock their file cabinets, they have extensive policies and procedures, they control access to their keys and physical access devices, they use antivirus programs on their computers, they use a Microsoft and online cloud security solutions. And so now they are finally in compliance with these 17 factors. One of the things I do want to leave as a parting thought is that everyone in the company plays a role in cybersecurity. Everyone needs to understand what that is. You can convey that through employee awareness and training, but it's very important that everyone do their part. A lot of companies struggle, as I said, because they don't have IT uh, staff and cybersecurity staff. So this is where you can use a managed service provider, a local technical support company, you can engage cybersecurity consultants. And this can be a, uh, a cost-effective way to shore up your technical competencies and your infrastructure, allowing you to stay focused on your business. And it can also give you time to build your in-house technical expertise. We've talked about a lot of things in, uh, with a lot of brevity. And if you're doing the things that I have outlined, then that's all good. If some of the things I talked about, you had no clue what I was talking about or how to go about it, then that really is a flag to you that you should get outside expertise to help you deal with those things. There are three really big reasons why you should take cybersecurity seriously. It's a legal and a business and an ethical obligation. It protects your company assets, personnel, and business viability. Uh, Connecticut uh, passed legislation recently that said, if you're following the NIST SP 800-171 standards or the NIST 853 standard, which is a higher uh, level of, of uh, cybersecurity, then uh, it protects your company against civil lawsuits. And so that's one of the reasons why, uh, it, you know, our state governments are, is, is recognizing the fact that uh, companies need to do a better job with their cybersecurity. 
one of the ways that companies can uh, get support is through cyber insurance. If they have a problem, you can buy cyber insurance. It's usually very uh, reasonably priced. However, I'm seeing on the forms, my clients have to fill out a lot of information about their cyber practices. And they're asked specifically, are you following NIST SP 800-171 standards? Are you following these NIST standards? If they are, then they get a break on their uh, policy costs. And um, it actually helps ensure that if there were a breach, that the insurance company would help uh, pay up and, and assist with the remediation costs. And finally, uh, we're all on the internet together. So uh, it protects everyone if, if we all follow good cybersecurity practices. I just wanna leave you with the thought you know, the effects of dealing with uh, ransomware are horrible. They're very painful. I don't think anybody is really prepared to deal with these. And, um, but at least uh, you should get started with the best defense that you can. We, we started by saying uh, that you don't want to be low hanging fruit. And so now is the time to get started before it's too late. Well, thanks, Teresa. Would you mind putting the, the previous screen up for just a second? There was an individual who uh, wanted to uh, contact you about a more lengthy question. Uh, I would uh, say that they should uh, reach out to you then at uh, the addresses you have on screen there, right? Yes, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay, great. Uh, okay, let's go over the first question. First question, are safeguarding requirements, are they a federal law, state law, or, or are they both? There's, uh, they're both. There are federal laws in place and have been around for a long time if you have federal contracts. Okay. Uh, there are federal laws in place for things like HIPAA and PCI compliance if you're handling uh, credit card information, if you're handling medical data. So there are federal laws in place. You know, we talked about the different types of information uh, that a company might need to safeguard. So uh, there is a body of federal uh, legislation on uh, a good portion of that. And at the state level, you're starting to see it's pretty spotty and inconsistent at this point. But as we were saying uh, a couple weeks back, the Connecticut State Legislature said that uh, uh, if you're following these best practices and the NIST SP 800 and uh, 171 and other uh, well-established uh, cybersecurity standards, that that will protect you against civil liability. Right, okay. Let's go to, uh, so we're gonna use the rest of the time for a little Q and A. If anybody else has any questions, you can just submit them via the chat feature, which is at the lower part of your screen. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, if a small business isn't looking for government contracts, what do you recommend as the base level controls? Are they the, the, the two? This is it. This is it. Yeah. I mean, it's no difference. There's no difference. Right, right. All that I'm saying is, uh, if you want to ask why do I pick these standards, it's because they are well documented. They represent the best practice. A lot of people will tell me, oh, I've got good security. And I, if you don't have all these things in place, it takes no time at all to compromise all of it. So if you don't have every single thing that we talked about just now in place, you don't even have basic cybersecurity. Right. Uh, next question, uh, when it comes to remote access, is Windows 10 Quick Assist, uh, is that safe to use? I'm not familiar with the Quick Assist, so I'd have to look into that and uh, get back to you. Okay. Uh, our company's files are stored online with a Dropbox, OneDrive type service. Is this safe? It's not what we recommend. <laughs> what we recommend uh, that's safe is uh, to get uh, something like the Windows or uh, AWS, but uh, most of our clients are 
uh, Windows based and you can get enterprise solutions that have very high levels of security uh, built into them in the cloud. But Dropbox and uh, a lot of the Google solutions, they're uh, notorious for being hacked. So no, I would say that's not the best solution. Great, thanks. Uh, next one is reports indicate that over 90% of all hacks are from emails. How can you safeguard against click first, regret later within your company? Well, the first thing that we talked about is employee training and awareness. Um, that's really essential because as you said, click first and regret later. Uh, the, you have to get people in the mindset where they uh, wanna reject everything unless they know uh, that it's safe. Another thing that you can do with the emails, uh, Microsoft Office, their enterprise edition and uh, for government contractors, uh, they can get G5 edition. Microsoft has built in uh, advanced persistent threat technology that will screen your emails and will block uh, incoming uh, uh, attachments and documents that, that look dicey. So uh, that typically means you have to pay a lot more for your services than if you get something on say GoDaddy or Network Solutions or some of these other email providers that, that don't do a very good job with the screening of incoming emails. Got it. Uh, next question was uh, heavy email filtration results in not getting all the email that you should. And what can you do about that? Well, again, um, if you look at a solution like Windows, you, they have rules. Uh, you work with a, a Microsoft partner who sets it up and you set up rules and they have a lot of sophistication built into the product line where you can say uh, email coming from different sources or email uh, that you know, label a certain way, uh, that should come through. So there are ways to actually improve that, but it usually means that you have to have an email uh, provider that is, uh, you know, it's probably gonna charge you more than the low end email provider. Right. Next question was, are static IP addresses safer than dynamic IP addresses and uh, are wired or wireless networks safer? Well, there's, there's a lot of discussion on this. Um, there are ways that uh, static and dynamic IP addresses uh, can be compromised. Uh, there are different ways that wired versus wireless uh, networks can be uh, compromised. Um, it really depends on the overall uh, network architecture that you're using and uh, the host of protections that you have employed. So it's not a simple solution. There, there are times when we recommend um, all those various combinations. And, and so it's not a, a clear black and white answer. Got it. Yeah, the next one was back when you were talking about destroying DVDs, uh, the individual was just curious, if he turns his DVD into confetti, with a shredder, uh, it, someone can still get that data? Yeah, and you know, what's interesting um, is that as they have a greater ability to pack more and more information, the technology is always evolving. So you can put more and more stuff on a DVD. So when you think about if you haven't shredded the DVD very well, you can get a lot of information from a small place. And the more the technology evolves, the more you have to keep up with it because you could extract more and more information from smaller and small pieces. Now, we're talking about protecting information that legally has to be protected. But yes, you can. if you are a hacker and you want to um, go after uh, information, you can recover it. Mm -hmm. Um, can you give us a next one was, can you give us a, a range of cost estimates for safeguarding an average company? No, uh, but it's a lot more expensive than people like, I'll tell you that. Uh, a lot depends on uh, how much you have in place uh, to begin with. 
and uh, how uh, tech savvy you are, um, but uh, it's not cheap. Right. Uh, Kyle's asking, my guess is that managed services providers are too expensive for small businesses. What do you think? No, I think, uh, well, it depends on, on, on how much money your company is making, you know, so it's, it's hard to make blanket statements, but actually we generally recommend MSPs. What I have found is a lot of the solutions that work really well have been very cost prohibitive where you might have to spend a minimum of $200,000 to get a certain security um, uh, system in place. And that's totally out of reach for a small company. But uh, we're seeing now that more and more security functions are being built into say ADM, US services or Microsoft services. And, uh, you know, you can go to a third party who can help you set those things up. I mean, I, I don't really know what people consider to be prohibitive. You know, from right. my point of view, being in this business my whole, my whole life, we started off having very secure closed systems, IBM systems, where the networks were private, that the whole operating system was designed so that every device was checked, you know, they had uh, pinging back and forth. Are you, are you there? Uh, are you authorized? And if not, uh, things would time out. What happened with the internet is uh, that uh, everything opened up and it was really easy to do communication, but uh, all these safeguards that had been around from the beginning uh, were lost. And so uh, I think people really had no appreciation of how vulnerable that they were and of how much security that they really need to have, if especially they're using uh, the computer systems for business. So it's a cost of doing business and uh, it was always there, but uh, the whole, we're really uh, engaged in cyber war on a global basis. And, uh, you know, we're all caught up in that. So. I, I think it's, you have to ask yourself, what's more expensive to be proactive and have the cybersecurity or if uh, all your company systems were compromised and your confidential records were posted on the internet, would that be less expensive for you than doing the right thing? Yeah. Next question was from Eugenia. She, the question is, uh, can you please speak to its FISMA F-I-S-M-A and SOX, S-O-X, and whether it complies to government contracting websites. Well, they do uh, apply, and these are federal standards for uh, cybersecurity. I see. Okay. And uh, what, what about if one is purchasing an existing business looking to uh, do government contracting, how can I find out if the website is government centric and security is compliant? Would you mind saying that one more time? <laughs> yeah. What about if one is purchasing an existing business looking to do government contracting? Okay. And how can I find out if the website is government centric and security compliant, I guess? Okay, so the way you do that is through uh, what we call a risk assessment, a gap analysis, where you have someone knowledgeable go in and analyze how the website is implemented and uh, you understand the vulnerabilities. And really it's like doing a um, house inspection before the house. The house can look very nice on the outside, but it could be a mess uh, inside and you don't you don't really know that unless you get qualified people in to take a look at it and kick the tires. Okay, great questions everybody. Uh, that's all we have time for. Uh, as a reminder, a recording of this webinar is available within a couple of days on the fairfieldcounty.score.org website. Please check our website for information on upcoming webinars. And again, SCORE offers free individual counseling. You can go to the next screen if you want, Teresa. Uh, so please use the link on the screen or visit our website and click request a mentor. We are available uh, for sessions via phone, email, and video currently. 
Also, please fill out your evaluations that have been sent at the end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's SCORE live webinar. In closing, a big thank you to Dr. Teresa Polaris. Thanks, Teresa, that was great. Well, it was a great talking with you and I enjoyed uh, the questions that people asked. I hope it was helpful.